I think TJ Perkins is is my guy. I'm not saying he's going to win the tournament. I mean, I think he should, but but I'm not saying he's going to win the tournament. I just I I think he's my guy. I think that might be a thing. Also, NXT was kind of useless tonight. Oh yes. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your NXT slash CWC review for August 24th, 2016. NXT, as I said in the opener there, was relatively useless, and I should remember this. Uh, that's kind of on me. Whenever they go out of town for a takeover, they film a bunch of matches that don't really mean anything, beforehand and and that's the NXT for next week so I I shouldn't if if there wasn't the CWC and if I hadn't missed reviewing last week uh, I probably wouldn't even be doing the review tonight uh, that's a thing that's no disrespect to anybody it's just nothing that happened on the show tonight mattered it was a highlight reel of of, uh, of takeover I, I and I'm trying to find a way to say that without sounding like a complete dick but I mean, it is what it is. Uh, we start the show off with a highlight reel of the whole show in Brooklyn. We're still in Brooklyn, obviously, still, even though it was taped before and time travel is fun. Ty Dillinger versus Blake. Yes. And as, as you will see momentarily, this match was about as exciting as watching paint dry. Ty Dillinger is a guy that I find genuinely funny to watch, or fun to watch in the ring. He's entertaining, he's energetic. Uh, I think they could really do some... He's one of those guys that I think is more suited for the main roster than NXT, if I want to be completely honest with you. Blake is nothing, and his music is creepy and makes no sense. Like, not creepy, cool, like Finn Balor or Bray Wyatt or The Undertaker, just creepy, like, why is there piano ballad music happening? Why is this a thing? Um, Ty Dillinger being the perfect 10, which is, which is fine and wonderful, and, and the gimmick is what it is. The crowd sums up my opinions on Blake, who's facing the perfect 10, with a Blake's a zero chant, which makes me smile. Collar and elbow tie up, Blake's a zero chant, another collar and elbow tie up and an arm drag, another collar and elbow tie up and a headlock by Blake. Because this guy's excited. I'm, I want to give this guy the Naomi treatment. Let's give him a chance. He did a headlock because headlocks are hard. Yes. Snapmare by Dillinger, chops by Blake because chops are hard. Uh, chops by Dillinger, thumb to the eye, and a takedown by Blake because thumbing somebody in the eye is hard. We got more commercial breaks in NXT this week than we should have because, let's be real, at the end of the day, it's the network and we shouldn't have commercial breaks to begin with. There's always a little network break in the main event of NXT. I've always forgiven that, and that's why I always kind of make the joke, eh, NXT's little version of, an, of a commercial break, but not in the opening contest of what is only two matches. Oh, come back. Clothesline by Blake, because those are hard. Standing cross-face thing that I don't even think he's... It's one thing to fail at, at a submission move and make it look sloppy. It's another thing when I'm looking at you and I genuinely think you're not sure what you're trying to do in the first place. Back elbow by Dillinger and a backstabber by Blake, which was nice. I will give him credit for the backstabber. I mean, everybody uses a backstabber and it's not unique in the slightest, but there's that. Front slam by Blake and a hip toss into the corner by Dillinger. Hip toss, simple move by Dillinger, but the fact that he does it in the corner and gets them all tangled up and the falls all awkward does make it a little bit more unique. Rolling clotheslines by Dillinger and a mud hole stop. Back body drop by Dillinger and a Russian leg sweep. The tiebreaker, because it's Ty Dillinger. Ha 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 Oh, it's the Death Valley driver over the knee that AJ Styles does, but it, it, it's good and he pulls it off well and Dillinger gets the well-deserved win. We replay uh, highlights from Rude versus Almas at TakeOver. Almas is a jobber. Moving on. Quick promo. He says, this is just the beginning of making NXT glorious. This was only step one, which is good. Bobby Rude on-the-spot promo, it is what it is. We replay Austin Aries versus No Way Jobbers A and the interference by Atami and the GTS, which is fucking great. Atami ruined my moment. You know, another promo in the back. Atami ruined my moment. He's just another guy in a long list along with Baron Corbin and somebody, somebody else that he mentioned that's trying to make a name off of me. It should be noted, in the long list of injuries that took place SummerSlam weekend, 
Apparently, No Way Jose sucks so much that he busted Austin Aries' eardrum sometime in this match. The fact that you couldn't tell that Austin Aries was going around with a busted eardrum is a testament to Austin Aries. And, and further... Oh, how can I say this? Further evidence, further points towards his deserving a better opponent, which is why I love the fact that he's going to be going up against Hideo Itami soon. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the, the fans are going to kick up political and bring up CM Punk again because Itami, they're finally letting Itami use the GTS that he invented. I'm a CM Punk fan, guys. You guys watch my videos long enough. You see how many CM Punk shirts I have. I'm a Punk fan. But this guy, apparently, I'm not going to speak like I know things, Sorry, there's shit on my desk and it's distracting me. Uh, I'm not going to speak to this guy before he got to the WWE because I don't know. But apparently, from what I've heard, this is the guy that actually created the... I don't know what it is in Japanese, I'm sorry. But the maneuver that CM Punk dubbed the GTS. I mean, they're going to keep calling it the GTS because that's what the fans know it as. Roddy, roddy, roddy. So the guy that created the move couldn't use it because they're all butthurt about CM Punk. Oh, yes. We replay Oscar versus Bailey. We see a promo in the back that I saw on dot com like a couple of days ago. Bailey talks about the loss. Bailey talks about, you know, puts Oscar over pretty much. Nothing nothing bad to say about Oscar, et cetera, et cetera. But she's pretty down in the dumps, Roddy Roddy Ra. No no pun intended to where she ended up now. Um, but it's it, in in a cool backstage segment, she uh, runs into Ember Moon, who made her debut at TakeOver, who was fucking phenomenal. Um, they put each other over. Ember Moon basically says, hey, even though you lost, you still did fucking phenomenal. Uh, you're the kind of person that inspired me to do this. I'm going to go and, and, and do fantastic things because of your inspiration. And Bailey, I don't think it's intentional, but she sounds kind of condescending, whereas it's where she says something to the effect of, I think you might ha you might have a future here, you might have a takeover match one day. She just had a takeover match. I'm not shitting on Bailey, but that was an awkward part of the promo. I, I get what they're doing. And then they obviously replayed her debut on Raw, which is all good and it's all wonderful and probably the only good thing that happened on Raw this week, for those of you that didn't see my long ass rant. I, I, I will say, despite what I say here tonight, uh, because there was a lot of good stuff that happened tonight later on in the CWC. SmackDown won this week. Hands down. I'm just putting that out there. And as I said in my SmackDown review, those SmackDown tag titles are the second prettiest belts in the WWE. And yes, I'm including NXT. Because as, as, as much as NXT is awesome, their belts are basic as fuck. And, and the women's division is just a whole plate of, of diamonds, which is... Which, it is what it is. We see a replay of the tag title match where Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa got royally robbed. That's what happened. And we see another bullshit, oh, flips not fists and we, we punch hard and work harder fucking bullshit promo. And then they talk shit about all the tag teams on the main roster because that's relevant, apparently. The Revival... The Revival serve their purpose, don't get me wrong. They are great in-ring mechanics for lack of a better term but at the same time they can go fuck themselves we replay uh nakamura versus joe and we get the amazing announcement that nakamura is going to be back on nxt next week oh yes our uh i i hate to even say this because it hurts my soul our main event tonight is tm61 versus the authors of pain with paul ellering at the beginning of the match, I wrote down with a big asterisk beside it, we still don't have names for the author of Authors of Pain. At the end of the match, Corey Graves lets us know that they finally do have names. They're Occam and Razor. For reasons. Uh, if they had said Toga and Razor, and I could make an old-school Ninja Turtles movies joke, I would, but it, we're not quite there. Um... Before the match starts, there's a lot of impressive double teaming and kicks and flips and dives by TM61. But then the match starts, and it's an extended squash. Uh, extended squash, by by that I mean TM61 did get offense in. They got some, some good offense in, some good tandem offense in. I didn't bother writing notes because I assumed it was going to be a squash. So that's, that's honesty from your buddy, your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC reality check. Uh, I didn't write notes for this match. I, I just didn't, because everything they did eventually got stomped out. Uh, Sky High Spinebuster by one of them, and then they do that wicked, almost comical sandwich double powerbomb 
thing that they debuted, I think, two weeks ago, where they powerbomb their opponents against each other and then to the ground. It, it, I like it. It's almost arrogant in its look how fucking strong we are. And I, I love the arrogance of that move, if not the effectiveness of it. So that was that was NXT, guys. Um, again, I say if there wasn't a CWC tonight, you guys wouldn't be hearing from me tonight. Um, I hope to be doing... And the topics are going to be various. I hope to be doing a hangout with a couple special guests on Friday. That's all I'm going to say for now. CWC. Um, they showed the re revealing at uh, TakeOver Brooklyn of the CWC trophy. Where Triple H and the guys from Orange County Choppers cock teased us and made us think we were going to see the cruiserweight belt now with all the other belts we've gotten recently i'm hesitant to see what the cruiserweight championship belt is going to look like but i still wanted to see it and we saw the uh the ta more footage from the tag team match that uh, gargano and champa had against the revival who robbed them and we saw gargano getting his leg taped up because his knee is all fucked up from that match because he's selling, folks, something that some people out there just don't know how to do. But that's a story, and it's obviously going to go into tonight because our main event tonight is TJ Perkins versus Johnny Gargano, which I'm looking very forward to. But Lindsay Dorado versus Rich Swan is our first match. Collar and elbow tie up and a headlock by Dorado and a knockdown, a pinning reversal sequence, and a head scissor by Dorado, and then a head scissor by Swan. Anything you can do, I can do better. It's fucking great. Both men dance. For reasons, and this is why I can't get into Rich Swan. I get that he's a good athlete. He, I get that he's a good wrestler. Um, but you're in a tournament to crown the cruiserweight championship. Uh, can, uh, cruiserweight champion. Sh you're in a, in a tournament to establish the cruiserweight champion. There we go. Which not only means you're going to be a champion, it means you're going to be catapulted to Raw, the flagship show of the WWE. Don't be stopping and dancing. Just fucking don't do it. Both of them. Headlock and a drop kick by Swan. Uh, pendulum kick by Dorado. Springboard drop kick. Suicide crossbody by Dorado and a neckbreaker by Swan. Swan grabs the guy, turns him upside down, and I there, I tried to come up with a way to describe this to you guys. You guys that saw the match obviously know what I'm talking about. You guys that didn't see the match, go see it. The best I can say is he puts him in an upside down combination of an abdominal stretch and the Brock lock. For those of you that remember when Brock Lesnar used submissions other than the Kimura, which we're going to talk about later, um, you remember he did the Brock lock, which was basically he picked up the guy's leg, wore it like a scarf and picked the guy up so he was dangling by his leg, which is pretty fucking brutal. And again, arrogant, if nothing else, in its show of power. But Swan, obviously not Brock Lesnar, no offense to Mr. Swan, but he's just not, does this thing and he's kind of crouched and he's got this guy in, 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 uh, in a thing. It's, it's a combination abdominal stretch Brock lock with your opponent upside down. Anyways, after that, they trade forearms, they trade corner splashes, uh, double kick to each other, they, they they scissor kick each other, which looks a bit silly, I know you try to have points in the match where, oh, you know, great minds think alike and they do the same thing, but the scissor kick was not great, uh, knee lift and a pendulum kick and a crossbody by Dorado, jumping DDT Ziggler style by Swan, standing reverse rock, Standing reverse Hurricane Rana by Dorado, Phoenix Splash by Swan, and Swan gets the win. Now, there's two points to note here. The Phoenix Splash, yes, I'm going to mark. Yes, there's a pun there because my name is Spaz Phoenix. The joke is there. It's the elephant in the room. I also love the move. I loved it since the first time I saw Seth Rollins use it. I wish he used it more often. I don't know why he switched over to the Frog Splash. Respect the fuck out of Eddie Guerrero. I know it must be some sort of tribute thing. I get that respectfully, but the Phoenix Splash is such a fucking wicked move. Second of all, Swan lands the Phoenix Splash on Dorado's face. Oh yes, that, that couldn't have been pleasant. Third of all, Swan is going to face the winner of our main event tonight, Gargano and Perkins, and either way, I figure I'm going to get a good match out of the deal. Zack Sabre Jr. versus Drew Gulak. Gulak just comes out and he's a dick and he won't shake anybody's hand and rah-de-rah-de-rah. Um, 
Zack Sabre Jr. I've heard a lot about and I didn't see it until he was in this thing. He is is small, and, and this is not a dig, but it, it, it and I get that it's a cruiserweight tournament, and I get that that's, you know, a chance for the smaller guys, and they have to be under 205, right, right, right. But I haven't seen him in a situation yet where he doesn't look very, very small and emaciated. Um, no knock on the guy's talent at all, because the guy's fucking great from what I can see. Um, they have a wicked, wicked, intense, almost desperate looking uh, chain wrestling frenzy to start the match. Saber works the arm, chokes Gulak with his own arm, and then transitions it eventually into a straight jacket choke. Uh, arm dragged by Gulak, and he locks on a straight jacket choke of his own. Anything you can do, I can do better. I love that story. It's it's simple. Armbar by Saber, springboard springboard stomps by Gulak are, are are an interesting way to go after we've had all this nice neat chain wrestling and submission wrestling on the, and some corner chops. Waist lock suplex with a bridge by Gulak is nice. Kneeling abdominal stretch by Gulak. Top rope something by Gulak because whatever it was didn't hit. He catches Saber catches his leg in midair and turns it or sorry catches his arm. My apologies. Catches his arm in midair turns it into an armbar, so he's like, he's, he gets slammed into the submission hole, which, it, it adds something, and, and the commentator, um, Daniel Bryan and Mauro Ridala do a really good job of, you know, it's one thing to be in a submission, it's another thing to be slammed into a submission. Gory Special by Gulak. Gory Special, which we haven't seen forever. Again, R.I.P. Uh, R.I.P. Eddie Guerrero and all that sort of thing. But the the Gory Guerrero special, that, that backpack, you know, inverted submission move that I can't even, I couldn't describe if I wanted to, gets transitioned into a pin, and then when the pin doesn't work, it gets transitioned into a Boston Crab. Seamlessly. <coughs> Seamlessly. Neck vice from the mount by Gulak, octopus stretch by Saber, and an ankle lock by Gulak. Electric chair by Gulak, Kimura by Saber, uh, slam by Gulak, chops and punches, trip and a running kick to the face by Saber that they call a penalty kick. Not everybody watches football. I'm just, I'm just saying that they trade slaps, and 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 it's easy for me to write that they just traded slaps on my notes here. But they traded slaps to the point that uh, Saber was knocked to both knees and looked like he was glazed over like a fucking donut. Um, Gulak tries for his dragon sleeper body scissor combination that we saw in the first round. Saber just uh, there's no other way to say it. He turns it. He he transitions it. He he counters it into a very very bizarre looking pin, and that gets him the win. Saber will face Norm. No, I'm, I'm I I have to not call him Norm. I've been told off for that. Noam Dar versus Zack Saber Jr. in the next round, and then we have. Match of the night, obviously, because it's the main event. I would put it up against any other... Uh, nobody's going to agree with me on this. Nobody's going to agree with me putting this up against um, Cedric Alexander versus Kota uh, Bushi. Nobody's going to agree with me putting this up against Gargano and Ciampa from round one. But I'm going to, because this match was fucking great. We had the story going in that uh, Gargano was injured from TakeOver, which is which plays fucking wonderfully into the match. Um, TJ Perkins versus Johnny Gargano. You guys know, I said this at the beginning of this tournament. I'm happy to see all these new guys, but you get a match, and I said this when Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa fought each other. You get a match between two guys I know in a tournament full of people that I don't know, this is going to stick out. Johnny Gargano versus, for lack of a better term, Manic, uh, aka Suicide, who I loved watching in TNA in the X Division, back when I watched the X Division and back when I watched TNA. I have a connection to this match. This match is going to speak to me more than the other matches do. That's nothing against the talents. That's nothing against the other wrestlers in the ring busting their ass to make this tournament as great as it is, but it means that this match is going to stick out by default. It's also going to stick out because it's a fucking amazing match, so let's get into it. Test of strength and a mount by Perkins and a flip by Gargano. Body scissor armbar combination by Gargano and he transitions it finally into the Muda lock, which is another thing we don't see enough. Uppercut by Perkins, dropkick and a suicide dive by Gargano. Chops by Gargano, a pinning reversal sequence and a surfboard by Gargano. Rocking horse by Perkins, rolling hot. My writing fucking sucks. Rolling kick by Gargano. Slingshot spear. You guys know I love that maneuver by Gargano. And some corner chops. Spin kick by Perkins. Insiguri by Gargano. Double boot and a sit out power bomb by Perkins. And Perkins, from the effort of doing the move, also lies down. So you almost have a double pin scenario. 
dropkick by Perkins, cannonball off the apron by Gargano, and he smokes his leg off the ringkeeper's bell table. Now, they did a great job before now, commentary, the, the scene in the back, reminding us, in case anybody's watching this that didn't watch TakeOver, you know, he injured his mat, he injured, injured his leg there, he's going in injured, he's all taped up. Now he goes and he takes this this uh, cannonball off the apron and smokes his leg off the timekeeper's table. GTS style kick in the face and a full Nelson into a code breaker, both by Perkins, are both probably the moves of the night. The commentators keep on referring to it as the lung blower. I don't know if that's a thing or not. Somebody tell me down in the box below. They trade punches and a drop kick by Perkins. Gargano tries to do some sort of javelin maneuver, uh, collapses to the mat, and, and Perkins obviously locks on a leg lock immediately. Pinning reversal sequence, a neck breaker by Perkins, snake eyes, and a successful javelin by Gargano this time, and a super kick, but Perkins trips him, locks him in a knee bar. Tra he, he turns his... He, he's got him in a knee bar, but he also tur turns his other leg inward. Um, so it looks like an upside... I, I, I'm shit at explaining moves that I've never seen before, guys. You know this, so bear with me. It looks like he locked him in a figure four, but he locked him in a figure four face down. Gargano, you know, claws and rips and tears trying to get to the rope, eventually gives in. TJ Perkins gets the win. TJ Perkins will face Rick, Rich Swan in the next round. I know... Or, or I have a very good feeling that he's not going to win this tournament. I really do, and I'm not giving myself any illusions. But I kind of really want TJ Perkins to win. I like the way that they did this. They um, they showed the importance of Gargano's tag team career with Tommaso Ciampa. His career in a tag team made him debilitated for this tournament, so he can bow out of the tournament without really looking like a loser. I mean, not that he looks like a loser anyway, he put on a great match, but it, it's an extra reason why it didn't do him any any harm to be eliminated from the tournament. He can go on, him and Champa can have their rematch, beat the Revival, get those fuckers off my TV, TJ Perkins goes on to the next round. Um, like I say, I... I I'm not trying to get sucked into the sob story and Roddy Roddy Rod because they've told Perkins' story and apparently it's not all all sunshine and rainbows and that's and that's fine. It helps us get to know the wrestlers a little bit. Um, combine that with the fact that he's somebody I'm already familiar with. You know, back when we watched TNA, we all watched these guys and we all loved these guys. You know, whoever we liked in TNA when it was cool to like TNA, and it's like, oh, man, imagine if that guy could get on the main roster. Imagine if these guys could get on the main roster. You looked at the entire X division, and you said, if WWE had a cruiserweight division, those guys would all be here. Now, we've already got AJ Styles. He's not going to be in the cruiserweight division, but somebody like Manic, a.k.a. Suicide, a.k.a. TJ Perkins, would make a great cruiserweight champion. Now... To all the people that watch Brit Ress and all the people that are watching, you know, you know, Japan Impact Pro or whatever the fuck the shit is over there, which is apparently like the unofficial gods of wrestling, they're not going to like me saying that because we still have guys like Tazawa and Ibushi in there and and Roddy Roddy Raw. We all know that Ibushi has is is doing some sort of help out thing with NXT. He doesn't have a contract, but whatever. But I really really wish I could believe that TJ Perkins was going to win this tournament. I hope they sign him, at least. I, when they came out with the Cedric Alexander and Triple H gave him the thumbs up and, and Roddy Roddy Ra a couple weeks ago, that was great. You know he's getting signed, or you know he's at least on his way to NXT, if nothing else. Even if TJ Perkins doesn't win this tournament, he's going to make whoever beats him look great. Give this kid a contract. I, I shouldn't say kid either, because he, I don't know. I, uh, I I really want this kid to win, and, he, and, he, and he's probably not going to, which kind of sucks. Anyways, the next round, the final four, are Akira Tozawa versus Grand Metallic, which should be good. Zack Sabre Jr. versus Noam Dar, which will be interesting. Kota Ibushi versus Brian Kendrick, and Rich Swan versus TJ Perkins. I'm already going to say Rich Swan and TJ Perkins is going to be the match of the next round. That 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 that's it, and that's the thing. I hope we get TJ Perkins versus Brian Kendrick in the semifinals. I really, really do. And that puts me in the minority. And you know what? I'm okay with that. Kid did really good tonight. These guys, Perkins and Gargano had a fucking amazing match. I'll put it up against any of the other ones. I don't care. <laughs>
How's that for me being cocky for you? Yeah, nice guy, Spaz, giving everybody hugs, hugging the SmackDown logo last night in his SmackDown review. And now I now I don't give a shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm cheering for TJ Perkins for the remainder of this tournament. And, uh... And that's that. Anyways, CWC was cool tonight. NXT was relatively pointless, as I mentioned. But it'll all turn around and it'll all get back to normal next week. SmackDown won this week. I have to reiterate that. I made a video. I did. A couple days after the draft. Why Spaz is Team Blue. Everybody laughed. Oh, yeah. But Raw's the flagship show. They're never going to let SmackDown be better. <sighs> Lying and laughing. Lion and Laughing is your buddy, your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation, keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, I'm tagging out, guys. Bye.